Hello, everyone. Welcome to Art Salon. I'm Ellie Shore, and I've been organizing this salon since 2012, which still boggles my mind. Uh, most of that time in person at the Armory Art Center and now virtually. Art salons are a gathering place for artists, curators, and many others who want to meet some of the leading contemporary artists in our region and to know more about them and their work. It's also a chance to meet each other and share our thoughts, questions, and experiences. Tonight's artist, Lisa Rockford, is well known to many of us for her wide ranging, innovative, and often provocative curated exhibitions, and for artwork that is equally provocative, addressing cultural topics from body image and gender to patriotism, consumerism, and the media. Five of her exhibitions, The Myth of Power, Humatorium, The Art of Whimsy, Appropriated Gender, Fiber Optics, and Gritty in Pink have received grants from the Broward County Cultural Division. And she has curated three weekend open air exhibitions for White Space, the Mortis Collection in West Palm Beach. She's also curated many others, but too many to mention. Um, Lisa is also an assistant professor, I'm sorry, an associate professor. She's just been promoted um, in the Fine Arts Department at Broward College, where she established the campus's first visiting artist lecture and workshop series on their North Campus based on STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. Lisa's presentation tonight will focus on her personal artwork. It is titled Minor hacker and manipulator. When she begins her presentation, I ask that you use your imagination to sense the energy, the whispering, laughter, and applause that would fill the room if we were still meeting in person. And now it's my pleasure, total pleasure, to introduce Lisa Rockford. Thank you, Ellie, for that introduction and for the honor of being part of this series. I'll start with a couple quotes that may help with the context of my work. As filmmaker Jim Jarmusch, steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light and shadows. Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. Authenticity is invaluable. Originality is non-existent. And I think this one probably sums it up even better. Author Austin Kleon says, what a good artist understands is that nothing comes from nowhere. All creative work builds on what came before. So tonight I will present several different series that are a result of my hunting, gathering, and cooking method, as I might call it. I collect or mine, sort, modify, or hack, and curate or manipulate images and objects into artworks. You will see several different methods and materials, but the common thread is in their starting point. Instead of working from my imagination, I'm interested in toying with existing images and objects. And my cats might make an appearance or two in here. This talk will be mostly chronological, organized by series. Although these series are very different from each other, you'll consistently observe themes overlapping with each other. So I'll start by talking about my upbringing and urses. And some of the themes you'll notice are my questioning of consumer culture, especially in the early works. My questioning of gender roles, appropriating and reinventing archetypes, and reflecting American politics, especially in the more recent works. I was privileged to grow up in a lower middle class family, privileged enough that we never went hungry, yet poor enough to be denied a consumer lifestyle, which I'm actually thankful for. I'm grateful to my mother, who's actually here tonight, for many aspects of how she raised us. As a single mom from the time I was six, she demonstrated how to be strong and independent putting herself through school while raising us so she could get a better job. 
It's also kismet that early on, we were not able to buy new or name brand clothing or toys often. So we would buy many things secondhand. And as a result, she instilled in me a love of thrift stores. Mining through piles of detritus, I developed a love for the hunt and great finds became ingrained in me and later part of my artistic process. We made many of our own toys or spent time on craft projects. So we learned how to work with our hands and be creative at an early age. This image is of costumes we made for a Halloween event where as a family, we went on the theme of dental hygiene. I'm not sure who came up with the theme, but I am the AIM toothpaste in the middle here. And my brother is dental floss. My older sister is a toothbrush and my younger sister is the tooth and my mom is the tooth fairy. I also learned how to make my own pinatas from paper mache. And this one is of Ronald Reagan for one of my birthday parties. I guess I was politically engaged and subversive even at age 13. When I was younger and Cabbage Patch Kids were all the rage, my mom worked with my grandmother to painstakingly create homemade versions of the dolls and later she bought us generic versions. I remember she thought it was really strange that I wanted the boy doll. I related more to his outfit and cool sneakers than the girl dolls and dresses. My mother may have thought my, many of my choices were strange, but she allowed me to discover my creative and unconventional identity. This is my first large oil painting going way back and my first large self portrait created in high school. And I only threw it in here because I think it's humorous that I chose to immortalize myself branded with the print of a US flag, a symbol which you'll see cycle back into my work more recently. In undergrad, my limited understanding of contemporary art was mostly from art history class and the course only went as recent as 1950s pop art. So my first big influence was Andy Warhol, who I idolized for his big person use of color, repetition, mass production and manipulation of found imagery. During undergrad, I was awarded a studio space and started to make paintings the size of the studio wall 10 feet long with a grid format often using transfers of found images that I would arrange, paint over and alter. So for the student show, we were only allowed to show one or two smaller pieces and these pieces couldn't fit in there obviously. So the night before the opening reception, I hung six of my paintings from the second story railing in the front lobby of the art building and gave myself a solo show and no one seemed to mind. On the right of me is a work with pairs of apples below faces of actresses and pop stars who have been sexualized in the media. The apples represent both breasts and objects of temptation in the story of original sin. This was one of my first references to the Eve stereotype and Adam and Eve being one of the most dominant stories historically ingrained in Western culture has helped uphold a patriarchal culture or fortify misogynist views about gender roles. I remember hearing the story of Adam and Eve as a child and thinking it was a bit unfair that the source of all evil and sin in the world was because of a woman. The story is just one example of the negative archetypes that have been translated by male authors persisted throughout time and shaped by our culture. Cyclical thinking depicts 100 objects and with a mind that's focused on sex could look phallic. It seemed like sex was on everyone's mind in college, and I was definitely aware that we live in a phallocentric culture. When I went to graduate school at School of the Art Institute of Chicago, I quickly became immersed in a more updated art history and could choose very specific courses for my interests, which I'll, I'll talk about. When I learned about feminist art, I met with Kruger and Holzer, for they both asserted strong messages in the female voice questioning gender stereotypes. They exhibited their work on the street, bypassing gallery exhibition setting and subversively inserted feminist messages into the public sphere by using advertising space. Like Warhol, they took a nod from graphic design to create artworks that were quickly readable with simplified graphics. I was inspired that Barbara Kruger especially had left a powerful career at Condé Nast publications. They create magazines like Vogue 
because she became opposed to the fantasy fueled appetite to consume and rectified representations of women. She used that experience working inside the magazine industry to critique it, using only vintage imagery combined with text in the female voice, often toward a male audience, and addressing the male gaze. Like Kruger, I was also incredibly disturbed by depictions of women in advertising and media culture. Why are these ads offensive if we use a critical eye? Not only do they present narrow standards of beauty and body image, but they consistently diminish our view of women and gender negatively. One technique you will often detect is zooming in or cropping and cutting off parts of the body, especially the head, which dehumanizes the individual or person and renders them as an object. Other ads allude to sexual aggression by men, violence against women, even inferences of rape. Here the man is acting animalistic and the woman looks to be passive as a willing participant, therefore depicting her as lesser in the gender hierarchy. As the feminist theorist Catherine McKinnon explains, men treat women as they see women as being. Pornography constructs who that is. Men's power over women means that the way men see women defines who women can be. In the same way, images we see in the media help shape the roles of women in society. And um, these were some of the theorists I was reading about at the time I was making works in graduate school. Even ads that disguise themselves as female empowerment often harken back to the witch archetype that if women are strong, they're also cold hearted man killers. So riding the subway every day in Chicago, one of the ads that annoyed me, partly because it took up the entire length of the train car, so you couldn't ignore it, was by McDonald's, a cheeseburger zoomed in so close that it was grotesque and almost sexual. It had the slogan, resistance is futile. It annoyed me that McDonald's was clearly gloating about their corporate power and at how many people continued to buy their substandard mass produced product. So I took one of the ads, scanned it and turned the burger sideways, manipulating it to be even more suggestive and mass produced it as a poster and postcard. I was challenging the societal expectation that women must be sexy or sexual and rejected the societal pressure on women that they should devote themselves to be attractive, docile or doll-like because those ideas keep females secondary, subjected to the pleasure of others, and vulnerable to be used sexually or disposed of like fast food. The idea that sex sells is used quite literally by several fast food companies, among other advertisers. Uh, they are utilizing what is called the male gaze, coined by feminist film theorist Laura Mulvey in 1975. Essentially the idea that in visual media, women are depicted solely as sexual objects for the gratification of a heterosexual male audience. She states that such phallocentrism results in the denial of female agency and identity, dehumanizing women to objects valued solely on the basis of sex appeal. The dichotomy between the act of looking, which is active, and the status of being looked at, which is passive, reinforces harmful gender stereotypes, perpetuating the very ideology which permits female objectification. I'm sure you guys know all this, but this is what I was exploring as I went through graduate school. Like in this ad, for example, where they are alluding to um, oral sex with the ad and kind of dehumanizing the female simultaneously. So this desire to work in the same format as advertising led me to take an offset lithography printmaking class in which one could use photographic images to create mass produced prints, much like the industrial process for creating product packaging, postcards and books. I learned Photoshop and continued to combine found images, questioning the societal expectations on women. This was my first use of Photoshop. And at this time, this is before you could easily grab things from the internet. So it was all scanning things in, um, scanning in printed images, pre-printed images. And I continued the double entendre between object and female anatomy. One of the classes that steered my work the most was called Propaganda and Decoration with Christine Tarkowski, 
at SAIC is a screen printing class in which we had to write a manifesto for every project. And one of the first projects was to make a poster to paste up guerrilla style as street art. Many of these early artworks show my unconventional perspective towards sexuality. I adapted the feminist ideas of having control over your body and making your own sexual choices to mean that celibacy could be a feminist act, that one could have ultimate control over their body by not allowing oneself to be sexualized, and therefore by not having sex, you would have more time to focus on yourself and your career before jumping into relationships and commitments. And this series played off of street signs, as you can probably see, but I called them stop signs. Another project in propaganda and decoration was to create a repeat pattern for screen printing on fabric. So I decided to continue the sexual signage as signage on the body. These prints began to evolve into a line of products for my thesis exhibition. To be a full product campaign, I also needed a spokesperson. So, or a mascot. So the pink nun emerged as a performative character to represent the products. I realized that the product should not only be directed to the female gender. So I also had boxers that said, lock your cock, among other phrases. My thesis exhibition was a store installation with multiples of several different products. I don't have an image of the installation on hand because I didn't have time to convert slides to digital. But here you can see me beginning the installation. Since I had many of the products left over, the Pink Nun appeared at various music festivals and conventions across the US. And here you see some of her main catchphrases associated with Pink Nun products. The Pink Nun often did performative street interventions and distributed items to people that she met on the street. Here she is censoring sexually explicit images on free magazines that are distributed in Las Vegas by applying stickers to certain parts of the imagery. Switching gears, once I moved to South Florida, I started a series called Rubbing It Raw, which was frittage with toy fashion plates. And that was because I found the fashion plates at a thrift store and started to play with them and explore how to use them, how they weren't meant to be used. So it started out as mischievous play without a specific intention and then evolved into obsessive exploration. I began to find out that there were several sets of these rubbing plates made since the 1980s with all types of characters. And I started hunting them down. Barbies, Transformers, WrestleMania, superheroes, Disney, Ninja Turtles, Smurfs, New Kids on the Block, to name a few. The sets could inherently limit creativity if you use them as intended because they're made for children wanting to have a shortcut to drawing. And instead, they essentially create a carbon copy of the images that were created by someone else. I first played a lot with gender fluidity examining stereotypes and power plays between male and female. I use parts of images from several different kits, mixing them together to explore hybridization and question iconic and marketed imagery. These were some of my first experimentations, which developed into she monsters because the first plates that I had found were fashion plates, superheroes, and uh, monsters. Some of my first compositions were representations of stereotypes that bothered me about gender. So I literally turned some of them on their heads. So the flowers, for example, are actually Disney princess skirts from Belle from Beauty and the Beast. And here those skirts were actually used as eggs where all these princesses are being hatched. Cinderella was cloned in order to represent the persistent ubiquity of fairy tales, which I believe deter critical thinking and present narrow models of gender and race and cultivate a lack of individuality. Continuing that, uh, I was exploring the myth that a female's main goal in life is to find her prince charming or in this case, Donnie Wahlberg, whose New Kids on the Block head was used for this. 
This one is simply an expression of the precarious nature of being female as they meander through different societal roles. One benefit of the rubbing plates is the ability to easily repeat an image, which works well to reference mimicry and the lack of diversity or narrow standards of beauty within American culture. Many of the rubbing compositions were later converted into large scale oil paintings. So the piece on the right, the she monster is about five or six feet high, almost life size. In 2011, I was given a solo show at the Art and Culture Center of Hollywood, which was called She Monster Sideshow, and each painting was based off of a legendary heroine or mythological female. So continuing this depiction of female monsters, I used a rubbing plate from Jurassic Park for this one, and the only parts that were actually changed are the head and the high heels from the original rubbing scene. So on the right is a depiction of Joan of Arc. I'm sure you're familiar with the story. It was a, a warrior that was killed for what she did as a female warrior and became martyred. Uh, and in this show, I also had cutouts where people could stick their head in to become a she monster or her bait. This is actually my mom and I in the cutout here. And then my family and my husband in the, in the picture here. One of the she monsters was Lilith, who is an alternate story to Adam and Eve. In the Jewish Babylonian Talmud text, third to fifth century AD, Lilith is Adam's first wife, created at the same time and from the same clay as Adam. Instead of being made from Adam's rib like Eve, she was made as an equal to him from the same clay. She left Adam after she refused to become subservient to him. She decided to grow wings and fly away. And in Hebrew language text, the term Lilith often translates as night hag. So later interpreters often envision the figure of Lilith as a dangerous demon of the night who is sexually promiscuous and who steals babies in the darkness. She is also depicted in Sumerian art as a female demon. Several of the works reinvent archetypes and mythologies like I've just mentioned, aiming to subvert the manufactured fictions of innocence, gender, power, and persona that result from those stories. Echidna is a half woman, half snake creature from Greek mythology, also known as the mother of all monsters. And she gave birth to most of Greek mythical creatures. Here she also doubles as Eve the temptress. This is titled The Evolution of Man. So as you can probably observe, many of these poke fun at extreme gender roles like the alpha male, who is only one step removed from Neanderthals. This is titled Identity Crisis, depicting a Disney prince whose hybrid masculinity is battling between the animalistic beast and the tender romantic. Here the visuals create parallels between the Playboy Bunny and Disney princesses, which I observe that there is a definitive connection between the representation of women as cute and childlike and ideas that females are the weaker sex, hence the stereotype that women cannot drive. Here you see the original rubbing and then I'll show you it as an oil painting as well. But you can observe how I combined Barbie legs with snow white upper bodies. And since they were two different rubbing plate sets, it embodied the impossible proportions that we see women being represented as. Uh, in the center are new kids on the block heads. So the work depicts a misogynist nightmare, the terrifying results of a coterie of women working in unison or the witch stereotype. It also mirrors the blonde bimbo typecast that is so omnipresent in leading ladies. This is a more obvious reference to Eve. It is called the discovery. What did she discover? Notice there is no Adam yet. And this explores or questions what the original sin was. I remembered hearing as a child that touching yourself for pleasure was a sin. This is my first attempt at stop motion animation. The girl is having fun dancing and along comes a guy groping and with a casual attitude, like what's the big deal? But I relate this to the Me Too movement and how much things have not changed. 
showing that women still do not feel safe and the gender hierarchy is still screwed up. So this gal emulates a fertility goddess, but her many suitors look a bit menacing. And I found it interesting looking at the actual rubbing plate of Superman, how his arm was very erect and sharp as a knife. So here Super Noah has made twins part of his trophy collection and they're flocking like sheep to their ideal man. Of course, it makes reference to Hollywood fixations in the blonde bimbo persona. Women also can typify the guardian angel archetype. Here they're lifting up men, putting them in the limelight. The women's faces are not seen. The individual women are not seen, but the men are made into rock stars. And the women so a metaphor for fallen angels cast out of heaven on the bottom. So a lot of my choices in image combinations and application of color are instinctual at first, and later I realize what they can symbolize. So for example, I really like how the color between the legs could read as both rocket fuel or situation. <coughs> Several works allude to the presence of evangelical influences in our culture. Here, the female is the sacrificial lamb who has absorbed the slander, curses, and shaming of others to stand autonomous. She's a survivor. This was made during the beginning of my teaching career. So this marks a shift when I started to appropriate stories from the Western art historical canon that I talked about in my art appreciation classes. As the ancient story relates, Judas people were under siege by the general Holofernes and the Assyrian army. Judith, described as a beautiful young widow, resolves to save her people by slaying Holofernes herself. After reciting a long prayer to God, she dons her finest clothes in order to seduce him. After Holofernes has drunk enough wine to become intoxicated, Judith decapitates him with his own sword winning a decisive victory for the Israelites. And this is the painting by Artemisia Gentileschi that I often show in class, which is made by a female artist, really one of the first female artists that we know by name in Western art history. And one of the few at this point in time in history that was actually able to make a career in art. So you might think that the story of Judith was depicted by Artemisia out of female rage, but the story of favorite among many artists in the Baroque era, like Caravaggio, who did the painting on the left. He shapes Judith as a more classical beauty who is afraid to get close to the blood, more like the women he might have known from the time period that it was painted. It is as if he's not quite convinced that a woman would be strong enough to do the task of a beheading. On the right, on the other hand, Artemisia seems to understand that women at the time of the Assyrians were muscular and not afraid to get their hands dirty and would have no fear of blood or violence. And they're most likely butchering animals as part of their regular routine of serving food. So continuing appropriation of art historical formats, the Vitruvian woman makes another reference to crucifixion and sacrifice, but also rebels against the lack of visibility of stocky or muscular female body types. Strong women have existed since the beginning of time, but portrayals of them did not take center stage until female artists like Artemisia Gentileschi were given the opportunity to offer their own perspective. So this Napoleon Bonaparte is after Jacques-Louis David's iconic painting. I'm sure you've heard of the Napoleon complex. Here I used a cabbage patch body. And one more story from the art historical canon. Apollo and Daphne was also frequently depicted by Baroque artists. And the Greek myth tells the story of the god Apollo who was in love with the beautiful nymph Daphne. But unfortunately, Daphne was not interested Daphne was determined to remain unmarried and untouched by a man for the rest of her life. In Greek mythology, it was not usually possible for a nymph or a mortal woman to resist the love of a male god, but Daphne was strong enough to reject him multiple times. Apollo persistently pursued her, so Daphne, desperate to avoid rape, pleads for help from her father, Peneus. And his solution was to use metamorphosis and transform Daphne into a tree. 
Her feet grew roots and protective bark began to encase her. She ended up sacrificing her body in a different way. So the moral of the story could be interpreted that women will be penalized for standing up to men. I compared Judith to the Little Mermaid, an equally twisted fairy tale in which the mermaid is willing to sacrifice her voice to be with a man. And here you can get an idea of the scale of most of the paintings. I diverted from the rubbing series about eight years ago, but I returned to the rubbing plates recently to create this work for Young at Art Museum, since the imagery is childlike and playful. And the boxes spin, referencing the exquisite corpse drawing game invented by surrealists where random and humorous combinations occur. My next series of paintings are also based off of child imagery, but instead specifically Barbie magic reveal activity books. The original pages have assorted activities and directives with sections where a child is supposed to use the magic reveal marker to expose the hidden image. Working with children's imagery not only speaks to how we are shaped, but allows me to be playful to discuss serious subjects. And instead of following the instructions, I've added my own line drawing and color, but I subtract nothing from the original. The modified pre-printed pages have been enlarged as paintings that are 18 by 24, which leave the viewer left questioning what is original and what is the truth. So on the left, you can see that the marker originally revealed. I instead turned it into her feeding her fears. What would Barbie's favorite shirt depict? Herself, of course. There are 48 in the series, and most of them are shown in this first showing on the right. In this piece, I don't know what was originally supposed to be on the pillow, but my intervention was to demystify the fairy tale and instead pivot to a possible real life predicament, hardship, or dilemma. You may notice the story of Judith has appeared again here. The basket reminded me of this depiction by Artemisia Gentileschi, who had imagined several moments within the story. The modifications that I make to the original images are also intended to magnify the figurative proportions and mores found within the activity book. I also use consistently use blue in the paintings in order to contradict the prescribed pink that is associated with female gender. When I first started the series, I questioned whether Barbie would be too trite of a subject, but the doll is so ingrained in our culture and so iconic that Barbie has become an adjective in our cultural vernacular as an archetype of femininity that is familiar to any viewer and ripe for the picking. What's Barbie thinking about? How she needs more work done. Her body will never be good enough. Barbie needs some updating. So introducing feminist Barbies. The next section of works that I'll talk about, or the last section of works, are reaction to the political climate. This montage I made from found vintage images, and I made this one back when I was in my offset lithography course. And the imagery is dated because it was scanned from vintage magazines. But of course, the choices of male leaders to amass unnecessary piles of weapons to assert their prowess is a continuing story that has only expanded since the Cold War. I reused the imagery more recently as a backdrop for an interactive installation. In front, there are three podiums similar to Olympic award presentations, and on the wall are belts that participants can choose to wear for a photo op. So you can probably see I took inspiration from wrestling prize belts, but instead hacked women's fashion belts, adding gold leaf and cheap patriotic jewelry that imitates military insignia. The front of the belt has a magnet in which different toy weapons can be attached. So when worn, they create a ludicrous phallus that is often ridiculously small in proportion to the human body. There were also magnifying lenses hanging so that people could place them in front of their missiles so that they appear larger. The audience's participation activates the work and offers unexpected theatrical poses that bring more layers to the work. And you could probably recognize this was in Fat Village, this installation. 
This was a collaboration with Ryan Farrell and he crafted the wood podiums and the ring which is attached. So there's an ultimate sport style ring attached by a red carpet. And inside are logos of the largest global corporations. So in comparing warfare to sport, I'm hoping that humor and audience engagement will lead to considerations of power structures. Another more recent interactive work I created is the Bride Laid Bear, which is made of a six foot United States flag split into whitewashed and stalled on the floor at the entrance of the gallery. The American flag is a symbol, just as the color stars and stripes in the American flag were designed with allegorical intent. In turn, I am utilizing the object of the flag as a symbol, a metaphor for the state of the nation. This work is also an ode to Marcel Duchamp's Ready Made, in which an artist can take an existing object and transform it conceptually with very little alteration by getting the viewer to look at it differently. My artist statement reads, the nation lays bare, exposed, vulnerable, and divided. The flag has been whitewashed to represent power structures, notions of innocence or surrender, and the suppression of history's intentions. It is also a clean slate for our future actions. The flag has been split in two, just as our nation is divided by political discord. The placement on the floor relates to the historic slogan, don't tread on me, yet also represents our nation's vulnerability and the tracking of our chosen movements. The title of my work was partly taken from a different Duchamp work, uh, and it's called The Bride Laid Bear because it alludes to the connection with female anatomy and makes reference to the assertion of power and violence inherent in rape and our individual responsibility toward the nation. There is also a connection between depictions of rape and warfare in art history. As Katie Michael states, art depicting rape and war was often the focal point and popular subject in Greek, Roman, and post-Renaissance Western European art. In fact, it was such a sought after theme that the term heroic rape was applied to these narratives. The heroes of the story claim victory over land and in turn also claim their opponents of women. These scenes of rape take on an almost romantic view and mask the truly heinous crime committed. Like in the rape of the Sabine women is the story of the birth of Rome. I expected viewers to notice the work when to the gallery and make a decision whether to step on it or not, because there's a six foot path in the middle or they could step diagonally over it. Instead, most people walk forward blindly without being aware of their surroundings. I had not intended subterfuge and did not realize how oblivious people would be to the artwork. If they did notice what they were stepping on, they were mostly unaffected and did not give it a second thought. However, the work caused such a fervent reaction from one veteran, and he had unwittingly stepped on it, not realized what he was doing, that he got so angry that he brought it to the press. It became viral in conservative news media and turned into a national news story covered by Fox News and Breitbart, prompting a couple hundred people to message me with vehement reactions, <clears throat> outright censure, expletives, and death wishes. I'll go to a video that I made about the work and in the video, you'll hear various robotic text readers transcribing messages that I received just after showing the work. I used several different accents in the video. Media inquiry, American flag art display. Hi, Professor Rockford. My name is a journalist who contributes to the online news website, Campus Reform. I'm looking into the American flag art display currently residing on your campus as a part of the 2018 full-time faculty exhibition, and was hoping you might be able to answer the following questions colon 1. Are you the artist behind the American flag art display? Question mark 2. How does Broward Community College feel about this display? Does this college support this? Question mark 3. What would you say to those who criticize the display? Thank you for your time. Dot sincerely. America, the great and proud country. You're lucky to be a part of country that allows such desecration as free speech. In my opinion, you're not worthy and respectfully ask that you leave. Try China. Doormat. 
Did you really use an American flag as a doormat at an art exhibition? If so, you are a despicable excuse for a human being. You do not deserve to be in this great country. Ruidoso, New Mexico 88345 Did you really have an exhibit where the US flag was walked across? If so, why? Self-employed. Went to Clovis High School. Desecration of an American flag is not art. You should be ashamed of yourself. I hope you know there are veterans groups and private citizens gunning for you to lose your job or at bare minimum be served suspension without pay. Your story's been reported to all of the local television stations. You make me sick. Bodies are delivered home from overseas under that flag. Fire, police, EMS work. Fast forward a little bit here. Slain soldiers, mothers and fathers who lost sons and daughters, that you tricked people into walking on the flag their child lost their life protecting? What you did was cowardly and beyond comprehension. You're a piece of shit. Sales and leasing consultant at Kia. Okay, well, I was about to stop it there before it gets into, um, it elevates into increasingly coarse language. Here you can see a close-up of some of the trackings of the viewer. Since it's white, it also acts like a canvas for the movements of the viewers. This is the second iteration of the work in which I added blush, bronzer, and shade. So the work would be more noticeable and might have increased engagement. The cosmetics were also added to have further association with the female body. And along the opening or middle of the flag, there are colors of a bruise. In conversations about this work, I asserted that our relationship with the flag has changed a lot because of the commodification of the image. Using the image on disposable and cheap products from napkins and towels to doormats and underwear. So after this work, I began mining the internet for the breadth of objects that utilize the US flag as print or surface decoration and can be interpreted as an undignified representation. Many printed the flag backwards with the incorrect number of stars or stripes designed to be disposable and most were made in China. I began purchasing and collecting these items from eBay, Amazon and thrift stores and obsessively built the American Splenda collection, which now has a few hundred objects. And you're seeing just some of those. And you can see the title is based off of the patriotic Splenda packets of artificial sweetener. So this is my proposal sketch to turn the exhibit into an installation as a survey of patriotic consumerism and a maximalist installation that offers all kinds of patriotic frippery. I specifically selected oddities with the belief that they will be artifacts that represent the time period that we live in. This work was a follow up to the previous controversial flag work exhibited at the same gallery. I was provided with a smaller installation space than I expected, so I extended it to the outside. The exterior wall offers patriotic attire and footwear that you have the option to wear while inside. And inside, you're welcome to touch objects or sit in the chair or take selfies, but it seemed that most people were kind of um, creeped out by the installation or didn't want to take photos inside. <laughs> Viewers first enter through a curtain with the graphic of a flag printed on a brick wall, which I thought finding that was kind of providential and fitting for a work made during the Trump presidency. The splitting of the flag also echoes the previous artwork. A mannequin with a bulletproof vest stands as guard outside. He has a collection of flag patches and is above his two ladies. I didn't know that you could even find patriotic pasties. Once inside, I want the viewers to be confronted with a patriotic hoarder's paradise that is intended to overwhelm, echoing the staggering excess of superfluous products that are on offer in the consumer market. And this is just a niche of the market. Eat off of the flag, put your cigarettes out on the flag, walk on the flag, and I can't get over the sheep wallpaper especially. 
While the objects appropriate an image of the American flag as graphic pattern and surface decoration, no actual flags have been harmed in the making of this work. Most items are unaltered, but there are a few artistic interventions like this mirror with lines of Splenda. I plan to create an expanded, more claustrophobic version of this installation. And this is a concept sketch for the next iteration. The series is currently on view as part of the virtual exhibit, Why Shouldn't We Talk About These Things at the Table at FAU. For that exhibit, I activated some of the objects from the collection into animations. So I'll play a couple of those. So the aim of this project is to broaden the conversation surrounding America's evolving relationship with its national flag while living in a time of increasingly nationalist sentiments. So what am I working on now? My latest series is titled Branded. I have been mining the rabbit hole of the internet to collect tattoos from subcultures that I am fascinated by and curate them into quilts. As someone who did several times and later regretted some of them, I'm fascinated by what others choose to permanently render on their bodies. So for the first branded work, I used the phenomenon of Trump tattoos. And yes, many people have branded Trump permanently on their bodies. After scouring the internet, I found 234 actual tattoos of Trump. I was so horrified by this phenomenon that I had to immortalize them before they get lasered off or written out of history. 
What's interesting is that there are almost as many anti-Trump satirical tats as those from people who are on the Trump train. Blush, bronzer, and shade were also, again, applied as homage to the artifice of Trump. This is a version without makeup. And notice I use sheepskin as the surface material in order to echo human skin, but also reference the idea of following the flock. So one of the more recent quilts is of pizza tattoos with over 400 different pizza tattoos. And that was just a touch of what I found. Uh, but I started to see different trends of types of pizza tattoos that people would get. And part of the reason I use tattoos is because I feel that they represent your brand and people apply fads and trends. And there's a lot of mimicry and overlap, but they also celebrate individuality, rebellion, and creativity. So to let you see this a little bit closer, I thought it was interesting just how many people not only had tattoos of pizza, but had certain types of tattoos of pizza. So in the center of the quilt are UFO pizza and surrounding that are pizza butts, pizza boobs, pizza vag, as well as pinup pizzas, pizza pentagrams, Jesus pizza, religious pizza, death by pizza, and memento mori pizza in the corners. Remember that you too shall die is the translation of memento mori. So it's been enjoyable looking back at the dominant themes in my work, and I look forward to hearing what you've responded to. If you want to see more of the work that I have not shown, you can go to my website, which is just my name.com. Good to see all your faces. Lisa, that was incredible. You stirred up a lot of feelings, I think, for a lot of people, certainly for me. I would like to tell people that our next art salon, you always have to have a commercial at the end, um, that's one of my jobs, is uh, the first week, the first Tuesday night in February, and Karen Reefus is going to be speaking. She's an extremely well-known and very well-respected and uh, high-achieving artist in Miami, and um, I think it's going to be fascinating to hear her for people that know her and for people that don't. So with that, thank you again. And good night all. Hopefully I'll see you again. Yeah, I hope to see everyone again in person. Or someplace else also. Yeah. <laughs> good night.